This is the Deliberate Talks Weekly Podcast, powered by the Pixelated Egg Digital Ventures. Tune in every week to learn something new about digital marketing and entrepreneurship. And now, over to the voice of your host, Dukshin Adiantaya. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to a brand new week. And I often get this question on how do you keep yourself motivated to release an episode every Monday? The answer is simple. I simply love the process of turning up here and talking to some amazing personalities from across the world and learn new things from them. And if that is a struggle for you to adapt, maybe Terry Tucker, our guest today, will help you with the right directions. But before we get on to our conversation with him, here are some cool facts about motivational speakers. Did you know there are an estimated 40,000 professional speakers in the United States alone, but not all of them work full-time? A data from Zipia on motivational speakers highlights that the most common degree for motivational speakers is a bachelor's degree. In fact, 51% of motivational speakers earn that degree, and close second is a master's degree with 14%, and third with an associate degree with 13%. And interestingly enough, the average age of motivational speakers is 40 plus years, which represents around 55% of the population. And now, more of inspiration and motivation with our guest today. On the show today, we have a motivational speaker at motivationalcheck.com and the author of Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. Here's introducing Terry Tucker. Hello, Terry. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Deliberate Talks podcast. It's lovely hosting you today. Well, thank you for having me. I, it's it's nice people like you that uh, you know that allow people like me to come on, and hopefully our conversation today will make a difference in somebody's life. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I'm I'm going to start with that, with not just impacting someone's life, but I'm going to start with your life, which has been a tall ask, as tall as you are. <laughs> I heard you are six feet and eight inches tall. Is that true? That is correct. Wow. Let's start with. What does Terry Tucker do today? What has he done everything in his life so far? Sure. So I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. One of the, I think it's the third largest city in the United States. And you mentioned my height. I am six foot eight. And I, I was able to go to college at a military school in Charleston, South Carolina mm -hmm. on a basketball scholarship. Wow. And when I graduated, I moved home to, to find a job. This was Unfortunately for me, long before the internet was available, and you know, I was all set to make my mark on the world with my new, newly obtained business administration degree. And I kind of laugh and look back on that now and realize, you know, kind of what a knucklehead I was to think I knew anything about business just because I had a degree, <laughs> you know. Right. But fortunately, I was able to find the the fir that first job in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the the hamburger chain in their marketing department. Unfortunately, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom care for my father and my grandmother who were both dying of different forms of cancer. So I, again, I was, I was in the marketing department at Wendy's. I was also a hospital administrator. I was a customer service manager of an academic publishing company. Right. And I was a police officer and I, I did undercover drug work and I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. And then I became school security consultant. I was a girls high school basketball coach, wow. a motivational speaker. Last year, I became an author. But for the last nine years, I've been battling this very rare form of melanoma. And then finally, um, my wife and I have been married for almost 28 years. We have one child who's a daughter who's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and as a lieutenant in the new branch of the military that we just created over here, the Space Force. Right. Okay, interesting. I'm going to catch on to that undercover part of it. Six foot eight and undercover. How did you sell that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tell you, that's a great question. I get asked that a lot. But the thing I always tell people about the, the drug business or, or the drug industry, and, and it is, it's, it's an industry, it's a business, is the thing that motivates it is greed. 
Uh-huh. And if you have money, you can find people to sell your drugs. And that's that's what we did. We had, we went out and, and did what we called buy bus. We would buy drugs from somebody and then bust them and take them to jail. So it really didn't matter my height as long as I had the money. <laughs> wow, wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to dig in more into that part of the story. But coming back to your the, the part of cancer, you know, which which kind of affected you for a long time and from a career aspect of it also where were you at that point of time when when cancer took over that was 2012 and and i had a school security consulting business and i was also a basketball coach that i talked about and it was kind of nice being your own boss because i could sort of ramp things down a little bit during basketball season and then after the season i could i could ramp up my business a little bit but I had a callus that broke open on the bottom of my foot right below my third toe. And being a coach, you know, I didn't give it a lot of credit because I was on, or at least initially because I was on my feet a lot. Mm-hmm. But after it didn't heal for a couple of weeks, I went to see a podiatrist, a, a foot doctor friend of mine, and he took an x ray and he said, I think you have a little cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. And it was just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it, no blood, no dark spots, nothing that would give rise Mm -hmm. to any concern. And he sent it off to pathology to have it examined. And then two weeks later, he called me and he said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years and I have never seen this form of cancer. You have a rare form of melanoma, which mostly we think of as a skin disease, but there's a rare form that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And that's what I had. And he recommended I go to MD Anderson Cancer Center here in the United States to be treated. Mm -hmm. And I had two surgeries to remove the the lymph nodes in my groin and the tumor on the bottom of my foot. And when I healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon, which basically gave me flu-like symptoms for two to three days every week after each injection. And I took those weekly injections for almost five years. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. And that was just to keep the disease from coming back. That was not a cure for me. Mm -hmm. The disease did come back in 2017, 2018. I had my left foot amputated. 2019, two more surgeries because the disease came back in my shin. Mm -hmm. And then last year, an undiagnosed tumor in my ankle grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my my shin bone. And my only recourse during the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated above the knee. And I also found out I have tumors in my lungs, which I'm being treated for now. So that's kind of my nine year cancer journey. Wow. Okay. And, and that's that's a very uncommon life, just like a conversation that you frequently have. You know, with you've been you have beaten cancer, yet you have looked beyond it and also started improving yourself. You do a lot of motivational speaking, give good talks and, and feature in podcasts like these. Has it limited your growth in any way you feel over the years? And in your words, how do you really define this mindset? How do you come out of this pain in this first case and you know try to do something beyond thinking about this? I don't think you come out of it. I think you use it to make you stronger, to make you tougher, to make you more determined or more resilient. I have kind of developed over these last nine years what I call my four truths. And these are these are just one sentence statements that that I've kind of developed through this cancer journey that I use to to kind of help me make decisions in my life. And and I'll give them to you real quick, because as I said, they're, they're only one sentence, but I have them on a, a post-it note right here in front of me on my desk, and I see them multiple times every day. So they constantly get reinforced in, in my brain. So the first one is control your mind or it will control you. The second one is embrace the pain and the discomfort that we all face in life and use it to make you a stronger a more determined individual. The third one is, is more of a legacy kind of truth. And, and it's this, it's what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth one is, as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. 
and and I use these truths to help, like I said, to help me make decisions. And and I'm on a clinical trial now for the tumors in my lungs. And I'm I'm at the hospital every day for a week, and then I get a couple of weeks off. And I had a nurse come to me recently and say, you know, Terry, this drug is really beating you up. And it, it does. It's it, it, There's a lot of physical side effects of it. And she said, you know, nobody would think anything less of you if, if you got off it, if you quit. And I tried to tell her these four truths and tried to explain to her how I live my life. And, you know, I told her my doctor may take me off this drug because it, it doesn't work anymore or it's creating too many negative side effects or I may die on the drug. But the bottom line is I will never quit the drug because I'm just not wired to quit things. So I I tried to explain the truth to her. I could tell I didn't get through to her. But for me, those truths work. And they they help me along with what I call my three Fs, which are faith, family, and friends, to get through this cancer journey. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, it's a very interesting part where you mentioned they don't buy it. You know, They, they don't get what you're trying to tell them. In a situation where there is someone like you at this point of time who's also diagnosing themselves with cancer, they would probably connect with you and understand probably what you're trying to tell them. But again, from that pain and agony point of view, like you said, you you could embrace it, of course, make it a part of your life. But the, the mind is honestly a very finicky workshop. It tells you a lot that you're not good at rather than what you're good at. How do you really master this art of pain and agony? Yeah, that's a great question. And and I think I I started to learn that this process of, of, of managing it when I was in high school, because I, I had several knee surgeries in high school. And, and being six foot eight, I, I was a I was a fairly good basketball player. And I was being recruited by colleges here in the United States to play basketball. And you're right. When when I had those knee surgeries, my mind started to say like, Hey, you know, you you might be a step slower, or coaches aren't going to want to recruit you because of your surgeries. And the first thing you need to do to to combat this is first of all to recognize it, because you know we're bombarded with with I don't know I've heard as much as six, sixty or seventy thousand thoughts a day, and you know you have to realize that every now and then one of these negative thoughts comes into your head, mm-hmm. and if you think about it, your brain, your mind can hold one thought at a time. Why would you make that a negative thought? So I learned to, one, recognize, oh, wait a minute. You know what? I'm still playing at an elite level and coaches are still contacting me to want to come, you know, talk about playing in their colleges. So I I, I just flipped the switch. I'm like, no, when that negative thought comes in, whatever it is, just flip it to something positive. No, I'm still playing at an elite level. No, coaches are still contacting me. So that is just a negative thought. And and you think about your brain. Our brains know our fears. They know our vulnerabilities and they know our insecurities. Mm -hmm. And and you're right. They will use them against us anytime we get outside the status quo. Because to the brain, the way things are now, it's comfortable. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. Everything's good. But the only way we can grow in anything, whether it's me in cancer or somebody in business or a student in school, whatever it is, the only way we can grow is to step outside that comfort zone. And as soon as you do that, that's when your brain starts putting these negative thoughts into your mind. So if you do that, if you do step outside that comfort zone, remember that that's going to happen. Recognize those thoughts. And then every time you, you have one in your brain, just flip it around to something positive. It won't happen overnight, but eventually your brain will start putting positive things into your mind as opposed to negative things. Right. And and what's the most easiest way to try to do this? <laughs> yeah, if it was easy, I'd write a book and then go live in some island somewhere. Uh, I just think part, I mean, the biggest thing you need to do is recognize it. it there's a the negative thought, boom, flip it around to something positive. It, it's a fairly simple process. But as I said, when you're being bombarded with all these different thoughts and ideas, it's hard to get through the clutter. So don't be, you know, don't beat yourself up or feel down because, oh, you know, I've got all these negative thoughts. Okay, you have them. You recognize you have them. And now you just need to flip the switch and put a a positive thought into your brain. And that's up to you. Whatever that that positive thought is for you. Just put something positive in there. 
And then the next time, something positive. Like I said, over time, it will get to the point where your brain, or at least you'll recognize those negative thoughts aren't as pervasive and you're, you're having more positive thoughts in your brain. So it's going to take time. It's not something that happens overnight, but it's something that if you stay with it, just like anything else in life, if you're resilient, if you keep bouncing back, you will eventually get to the point where you'll push out those negative thoughts and only be left with good thoughts. Right, right. Absolutely. True. And I'm going to go back to your uncommon life. That's one word that is frequently used and spoken about. But let's start with the conversation, everything about what you've done. You know, you've done marketing, you've done, you've been a hospital ad administrator, customer service manager, police officer, coaching the high school girls in basketball. Now take a step back and tell me the real kick behind it. You know, you're always trying something new. And what are the challenges you faced in each of these situations? And how did you really overcome this? So I, I think the answer to that question is I needed to be true to myself, to the to the purpose that I was put here on earth. When, if, if you look at my career progression, the first two jobs were, were in business. They were in the marketing department at Wendy's and then as a hospital administrator. Those were the jobs that I took because my father was, was ill. My father was dying at the time. And my passion was to be in law enforcement, to be in, in the police department, but my dad's father was a policeman in Chicago and was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. It was not a serious injury. He was shot in the ankle. But my, my dad always remembered the stories that his, his mom, my grandmother, told about the knock on the door of Mrs. Tucker, please grab your son. Come with us. Your husband's been shot. So my dad wanted absolutely nothing for me in terms of law enforcement. He had my whole, my entire life planned out. You know, you're going to go to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get a job in business. You're going to get married, have 2.4 kids, live in the suburbs, and live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. But that's what my dad wanted for me. That wasn't the life that I believe. That wasn't the passion I have that I was put on this earth for. So I didn't want to upset him. I loved my father. He was my hero in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But I waited until he passed away until I got into law enforcement. And, and that was my passion. That was, I can't wait to get up and, and what are we gonna do today? How are we gonna help people? How are we gonna make a difference? I couldn't wait to do that. And I always tell young people, especially, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you wanna do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things that you are going to regret are not gonna be the things you did. They're going to be the things that you didn't do. And by then, it's going to be too late to go back and do them. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, I'm just going to come back to this SWAT hostage negotiator. Tell me about that part of your life where you might be meeting kids, you might be meeting adults into crime, drugs, and societal tendencies, right? From being a marketer, from being a consultant, and all that thing that you've done to suddenly shift your focus completely into what you want to do and what you love to do. How does one adapt firstly to the sensitive situation and understand what these kids and what these adults are going through? And what is the kind of training that you went through to really adapt to this situation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, again, I became a rookie police officer when I was 37 years old, mm -hmm. which is, it, it, at least here in the United States, is pretty old to become a policeman. But I always had, you know, a goal of wanting to be the best, whether it was the best basketball player or the best hospital administrator, whatever it was. So when I got into the police department, I wanted to be in a group of people that were the best, that got the best training and had the best equipment. And so I applied to be a negotiator on the SWAT team. And I had to go through a physical fitness test and a psychological exam and interviews and all kinds of stuff. And when I finally got on, there was a movie here in the United States called The Negotiator many years ago. Mm -hmm. Samuel L. Jackson, a very famous actor, played this negotiator. And I always get, you know, is it like that? I'm like, no, it's nothing like that. It's, it's more of a team approach because what we do is, yes, one person is negotiating with, with whoever is barricaded or, or whatever the situation is. And then there's a person sitting right next to them listening to the conversation 
and writing us notes, you know, like here, you know, ask about his mother or don't ask about his mother and things like that. And then there's probably three or four other people that are that are kind of out in the crowd in, in interviewing maybe the person's mother or their spouse or their brother about why are we here today? What happened? What, you know, what brought this on? What's the, what's the background? And like I said, you know, maybe he's mad at his mother. So if I'm negotiating with somebody, I'll get a note from the person sitting next to me. He said, don't mention his mother because he's upset with her. OK, good. That's good information to know. We are a team working to solve this. But the other thing about that and the thing that's interesting is as a policeman, 99 percent of the time we're dealing with people face to face. Mm-hmm. I can see you. You're in front of me. I, I've been called to your house or you've been stopped for a traffic violation or whatever it is. So I am with you. And I can I can look at the visual clues that you might be giving off. You know, if you're balling up your fists, maybe you're going to want to fight me. Or if you're looking around, maybe you're going to want to run. Mm-hmm. And I can do something about that. I can sit you down. I can put you in the back of the car. I can handcuff you. But as a negotiator, that person's not with us. We are maybe a block away or we're negotiating through a door or something like that. So I can't see anything that's going on. So you needed to get good at figuring things out based on what people were saying, what they weren't saying, and how they were saying it. And that was that took a long time for me to kind of get that nuance. And the other issue or, or the other thing that's important in negotiating as with any relationship, whether it's a you know boss subordinate, whether it's a husband and wife, whether it's a parent child, is trust. That person who's on the other end of the phone is obviously having the worst day of their life if they're talking to me. Right. So they need to trust me. And one thing we never did to people was lie to them. And we certainly had people that said, hey, I'll come out, but I don't want to go to jail. Mm. And we would have to say to them, OK. I want you to come out. I want this to be a safe resolution, but you're going to go to jail. But we would, so we wouldn't lie to them, but then we would deflect that and start talking about something else to get their mind off of going to jail. So we never lied to people because, in all honesty, a year from now, 18 months, two years from now, there was a good chance we would be back negotiating with this person again. And if you didn't have that trust factor, then the person was like, no, I don't want to talk to you. You lied to me the last time. Mm. And it's very hard, you know, as all of us know, if we've ever lied to somebody and got caught in it, it's very hard to build that trust back up once you've hurt somebody like that. Right, right. Absolutely. That sounds very fascinating again. So tell me a little bit more about the kind of stories that you were involved in when you were a hostage negotiator. I, I, I'll give you a couple. One, one is uh, sort of a, I mean, the, they're both in a way kind of funny, but one is a little more tragic than the other. I, I uh, we were not a full time SWAT team. So we and I'm again, I'm going to date myself really bad. Now, we carried pagers with us. <laughs> and when the pager went off, you called in, gave your number. And most of the time as negotiators, we were called to the scene. And I happened to be working this particular night. So I was in uniform. I was in a marked car and I got to the scene and I was talking to the officers about what was going on. And they said, the man inside is drunk. He has a gun and he won't let his wife go. I said, "Okay." And they had him on the phone. So I got the phone and we talked for about 10 minutes, which is a very short period of time. Usually our negotiations lasted, I don't know, a couple hours, maybe three, four hours, depending on on what the situation was. But after about 10 minutes, I'm like, okay, I said to him, what would it take for you to come out? And he said, give me a beer. (laughs) I said, if I got you a beer, you would put the gun down, you'd let your wife go and you'd come out. He said, yeah. So I gave $5 to one of the officers and I said, go down to the store, buy a beer. He did. We, We put the beer on the front porch. And I said to him, your beer's on the front porch, but you don't get it until your wife comes out and you put the gun down. And he's like, do I have your word? I can drink the beer. I said, you have my word. Again, going back to the the trust factor we just talked about. And so he did. You know, his wife comes out. He comes out with his hands up. He gets handcuffed. He drinks the beer and off to jail he goes. You know, so it it was kind of a funny, very short resolution. Like, just give me a beer and I'll go to jail. Okay, I'll give you a beer. Go to jail. And, And so that was it was kind of funny. The other story 
was a bit more tragic. This man wanted to kill himself and he had slit his wrists and then he had turned on the gas in his oven and he put his head in the oven. The the wrist slitting didn't work. The, The gas in the oven didn't work. And somehow he called the family member or a friend and the family member or friend called the police and I was talking to him and he had a gun now. He was going to shoot himself. Okay. And we talked for a couple hours. Finally, in all honesty, I think I just warmed down. I think he was tired. And he's like, I want to come out. I'm like, okay, great. I said, just put the gun down, come out and I'll come down to the scene where you are and we'll talk face to face. He's like, I'd really like that. I'm like, okay, great. I said, but don't hang up the phone, bring the phone with you. And then when you get outside, just do what the police outside tell you to do. And so he ended up hanging the phone up, which I didn't think much of because, I mean, let's face it, when we when all of us end a conversation, it's just normal practice to hang the phone up. So he hung it up. But about 15 seconds later, one of the, the tactical guys, one of the, the officers who was surrounding the house came on the radio and said, we heard a gunshot. Oh. And I thought, are you kidding me? He shot himself? He did. He shot himself in the head. But what was funny about this situation is the angle of the bullet went, it was right about his temple. It went underneath his skin all the way around his skull and came out the other side. It never penetrated his skull. It never got to his brain. And I'm thinking, this guy's tried three times to kill himself today. You know, I tell me there's not a guy up there that's like, you know what? I don't want you up here yet. It's not your time. So no, this isn't going to happen. My goodness, that's that's one lucky day, and and it is. And, and does he survive today to tell the tale to many others? As far as I know, he is. I, I mean, he he obviously went to the hospital. I mean, you know, you shoot yourself in the head. You you, you know, there was a lot of blood because it's a head wound, and the right. the head bleeds a lot. But in terms of the seriousness of the injury, it really was not a serious injury at all. I think he was in the hospital for a day or two, and and then he ended up going to jail for you know, for what he did. So it was like, okay, I, you know, as far as I know, he's still alive, but this was a few years ago. So I I can't say for sure. Right. Right. Wow. That's, that's some adventure there. You know, there's a lot of happiness that's also there when the cases resolve or when you, when you come out with a, a successful negotiation or a conversation with, with people and saving and impacting so many lives. So that's fantastic. And I see why that passion to quit what you're doing and going and doing this would give you more satisfaction now comes into the picture, right? So great stuff there. And uh, I'm just going to move also into this conversation of your book. You know, that's, you also are an author. So congratulations for that. And, uh, and, and tell me a bit about that. What inspired you to pen down that journey for you? So the the book was really inspired out of two conversations that I had. One was with a former basketball player that I had coached, and she had moved to the area of the United States where my wife and I live. And my wife and I had had dinner with her and her fiance. And I said to her, I'm really excited that you're living close to us and I can watch you find and live your purpose. Mm -hmm. And she got real quiet for a while. And she looked at me and she said, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? And I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put here. And then once you find it, living that reason. So that was that was one conversation. And then I had a a young college student who connected with me and wanted to know what I thought were the most important things that he should learn to not only be successful in his job or in business, but in life overall. And I didn't want to give them the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. Not that those aren't important. They are. They're very important. But I kind of felt they had been done uh, and done a lot. So I wanted to try to give him something new, something that maybe would would resonate in in his heart or in his soul. So I took a little while and I wrote some notes. and, And eventually I had these 10 principles and I sent them to him. And then I kind of stepped back and I was like, you know, I've got a life story that fits under this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates this principle. And so, as I said, I had my my leg amputated in April of 2020. I started chemotherapy for the tumors in my lungs in June of 2020. So during that three-month period where I was healing, I sat down at the computer every day, and I started to build stories under each of these principles. 
And eventually I had the book and the book's called Sustainable Excellence, The 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and how's the book doing? And, and how long has it been for you? The book came out in October of last year. It's doing well in the United States. It's, it's really kind of had a, an international takeoff with uh, the number of podcasts that I've been fortunate to do around the world. And so I, I'm, I'm very happy with it. You know, it's funny when I, when I first released the book, I was, I got to sell books. I got to sell books. I got to sell books. And I, I had a best-selling author over in the United Kingdom who I'd connected with on LinkedIn. And he kind of pulled me aside, so to speak. And he was like, Terry, you're missing the point here. Your job is not to sell books. Your job is to help people. Right. If you help people, the books will sell themselves. And I was really kind of glad he said that because I, I didn't write the book to make money or to get famous or, or even to get more speaking engagements. I wrote it to help people, to try to make a difference. And he kind of put that in focus for me. So, you know, the book is there but it's not something that I get all excited about, you know, selling books anymore. It's just more about helping people. Right. Awesome. And and this journey of a motivational speaker, let's talk about that. You know, every speaker needs an audience just as every author needs a reader and every marketer needs a customer. How in each phase of your life have you motivated to build an audience for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question because I, you know, I, I look back on my, my time playing team sports, which, you know, was pretty much the first part of my life. You know, I started playing basketball when I was nine and I stopped playing when I was 21, when I finished uh, my senior year in college. And the thing that I realized about that time was the connectedness that I had to a group or to something that was bigger than me. You know, in, in a team sport, if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down and things like that. So I, I think it's real important, especially in this day and age when we kind of have, again, I'm going to make a huge generalization here, where a lot of people are, it's all about me, you know, what's in it for me. And, and, and that was really important for me to realize that I am connected to everybody. You know, I'm connected to you. I'm connected to my family, to the people in, in the UK that I did a podcast with yesterday. I, I'm, we're all connected. And, and that's the important thing to remember that. If you think about it, the greatest team sport that we all play is the game of life. And as much as you want to say, you know, it's all about me, it really isn't all about you. It's about us, not just you. And I think that was an important thing for me to learn and to try as I, you know, would progress, be a captain of a team or something like that, to make people realize that this isn't about you. You know, nobody cares about you. People care about us us collectively. And I think if we could could really focus on that more as a culture, as a society, we'd get a whole lot more done because we're spending a lot of time screaming at each other and we're not listening to what each other is saying and we're not listening to understand where that person's coming from. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Wonderful. And I'm going to ask you one last question in this round, which is because you do so many things, again, do people tell you why did you switch so many times? Can't you stick to one job and master it? Or do you even get things like, I can never do it, or, or I don't have patience like you to do so many things? In such a situation, if you do, how do you tackle these kind of questions? Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I sort of laugh sometimes when, when people will read you know, my, my sort of resume before a podcast. And I, I kind of laugh. It's like, yeah, one of these days I got to figure out what I'm going to, what I'm going to do when I grow up, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, people sometimes ask, you know, why the different transitions and things like that. Part of them, as I said, you know, the first couple of jobs were what my dad wanted me to do. The law enforcement thing was important um, and, and a passion and a purpose for me. And then when I had to move on from that, it was because of my wife. My wife is the the primary breadwinner of our family. She supported me in a law enforcement career. You know, when she married me, I was a hospital administrator, you know, a suit and tie kind of guy, eight to five, Monday through Friday. And then I'm like, hey, hon, I'd like to go work nights and weekends and get shot at and do under, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And she knew it was my passion. So she supported me. And then when, when she lost her job and we had to move and I had to find something else to do, that was my way of supporting her as well. So 
again, it comes back to trust. It comes back to support. It comes back to family. But your, your uh, question about people saying, I, you know, I could never do that. Those people drive me crazy because the answer to your question is, yeah, you're right. You can't because you've already decided in your head that you, you can't do this. So you can't make this. Why would you start something that you've already decided in your mind you can't do? I mean, that's just a waste of time and resources. Why wouldn't you go into it and say, you know what, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be hard, but I'm going to give it everything I've got and we'll see what happens. I mean, here I was a 37 year old rookie police officer. You know, most people would be like, oh, heck, I'm not doing that. I'm too old for that. Mm -hmm. But you can do anything you want. The limits that are placed on us are limits that are placed by us. So I, I always tell people that it's like everything you need to succeed in life is already inside you. You just need to find it and pull it out and use it for your benefit. Absolutely. Very well said there. And that's a great way to conclude the first round of questions. Terry, okay. time to lighten up the mood and go a little more candid. This is the rapid fire round of questions. Are you ready for this? Great. I'm looking forward to it. I love this. <laughs> okay, then. What is the biggest struggle according to you in today's world? I think the biggest struggle is we don't listen to each other. We hear because we want to respond. You know, you're saying something. It's like, don't you hurry up and say something because I want, I want to respond as opposed to listening to what you're saying and why you're saying it. If we did a better job of that, I think we'd be much better off as a society, as a country, you know, as, as a world, if we took time to understand where each of us were coming from. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay. Tell me three things people should add in their daily routine as a task or incorporate as a habit to live a better life. I think a couple of things, let's see. First of all, I'd say you need to say no more often. If you look at the most successful people in the world, they say no a lot more times than they say yes. Mm -hmm. Because no means, you know what, I've got time to do other things that are more important. So saying no would be one thing. Number two, I think people need to read more and, and, and read all different kinds of things. Become um, intelligent, become literate, become smart. And that way you can make informed decisions. So I would say read would be the second thing. And I guess the third thing I would do, I would tell people is they need to stop or they need to put down their electronics and connect with each other more personally. I, I, I've had people in my life who were wanted to be policemen and they were like, well, what do you think I need to do to be a police officer? I said, put your phone down, go out on the street and talk to the homeless person there, go up to the penthouse and talk to the rich guy upstairs. Right. If you can do that, you'll be successful as the police officer. You can't be a good cop if you're always texting somebody. So we've got to connect with each other more. Mm, right. Okay. What is the best quote you have heard or you follow a lot more frequently? The probably the best quote I have and the one I like, or the, certainly the one that's resonating with me most now is this one. A careful person I want to be, a little person follows me. I dare not go astray for fear they may go the same way. I think there's always people out there that are looking, they're looking at you, they're looking at me. I, I had a nurse recently ask, tell me a story that she said, when I first met you, I was going to get out of the nursing profession. I had had a, a close friend die. I was in a dark place. And, and I talked to my mom and dad. I was going to get out and I was going to go work for Amazon. And she said, then I met you. And I saw what you go through every day to try to help other people with your therapies and that and, and your story. And I knew I was in the right place. Mm -hmm. And if she had never told me that, I would have had no idea that my life had an impact on her. Right. Think of all the people that are watching you, that are watching me, that we never know who they are, but they're they're looking to emulate us. They're looking to be, you know, what what is Duction doing? What is Terry doing? And and I want to be like that, but we never know who those people are. So I always I, I like that quote because it kind of puts things in perspective. Like you know, if you if you make a mistake, if you if you really mess up, people are going to look at that and say, "Boy, you really let me down." So that that would be my quote. Okay, wonderful. One piece of advice for all those struggling mentally and physically today would be? I would say this. Someday your pain, your, your difficulty, whatever you're going through is going to end. For me, my, my pain may end through surgery. It may end through medication. Quite frankly, it may end when I die. 
But if I quit, if I give up, if I give in, then pain will always be a part of my life. So I would just tell people, keep going. There, there was a study done here in the United States at Harvard University back in the 1950s with rats. And, and this man put rats in a, a tank of water and he had them tread water until they were going to sink. And right before they sank, which was about 15 minutes, he pulled them out. He dried them off. He let them rest for a while. And then he put them back in the tank. And what you would think is that those mice were tired. So they maybe they treaded water for 10 or 15 minutes or, or maybe even 20 minutes later. But those mice treaded water for 60 hours because they knew they were going to be rescued. What that taught me was our bodies can do so much more than we ever think we can do. So when, when you get to that point where you think you're done, just tie a knot in the end of that rope, hang on, because your body is able to do more than you ever thought it could do. Right, right. Okay. And what does an extraordinary life look like? So let me give you a, let me give you a definition of success that I heard years ago that I think will illustrate that, that point. What does an extraordinary and uncommon life look like? Mm -hmm. And this, is, this was from a basketball coach who was extremely successful. But if you'll notice in the definition of success, it doesn't say anything about success. It doesn't say anything about winning or being the best. This is the definition. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing that you did your best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. Oh, okay. And what is next in your I must try this list? <laughs> I'd like to write another book. The first book I wrote was about success, what, what you do to be successful, what I do to be successful. But the second book, I think, needs to take a different focus on another word that begins with S, and that word is significance. Mm -hmm. Success is what we do. Significance is what we do for other people. And, and at this point in my life, I think significance is probably more important than success. Now, don't get me wrong. I think you can be both. I think you can be successful and significant, but I'd like to write another book that really focuses on significance. Wow. Fantastic. And good luck for that, Terry. And Thank you. That brings us to the end of our second round. Moving on to our last segment. Terry, this is a question we take from one of our listeners. And this one comes from Abhishek Borkar. And he asks, there are people who are self-motivated to learn and achieve their goals. And then there are over-motivated people who, when fails, feels completely devastated about it. It also leads to competition and temper. How do you draw the line and not let motivation become your enemy? Because it's funny, you said that one of the chapters I, I wrote in my book was about the importance of failure, especially when you're young. That that. Failure does a couple things. One, it helps you to learn. And, and a lot of people don't fail because they never start. One of the other chapters that I talk about in the book is titled, Most People Think With Their Fears and Their Insecurities Instead of Using Their Minds. So if you do that, you're never going to fail because you're never going to try anything. And the way I look at it is, if you try something... Only two things can happen. One, you can you can win, you can be successful, or two, you can learn. And people are like, no, 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 you win or you lose. And I'm like, you only lose if you don't learn something from that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure you ever get to a point. You know, I mean, I'm sure you can kind of just, you know, turn up the gas and it's like, oh my God, I'm totally out of control. But but I, I think motivation, as long as you realize that it's okay to fail then you can handle that. I, I'm going to use my motivation to do this. And if I fail, it's okay. But so many people are like, I'm not going to do that because I'm afraid to do it. Or what people think of me if I fail? Or what if, what, what if I don't learn anything out of this? I don't care how you look at it. What matters is, am I going to do that? Because I think it kind of goes back to the question you asked me earlier about, you know, people who say, I could never do that. Yeah, you're right. Because you're not motivated to do it. You, you don't think you can be successful. Use that motivation to at least try. And if you try and fail, as long as you learn, you're in good shape. Absolutely. Wow. 
Great stuff, great stuff there. Wonderful, Terry. This brings us to the end of the segment and the show. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. I had a great time hosting you. I hope you had your share of good time too. I did, Dushkin. Thank you for having me. And again, I, I appreciate you having me on. And hopefully our conversation today will, will make a difference in the, in the lives of some of the members of your audience. Absolutely. Wonderful, Terry. Thank you so much for being a part of the Deliberate Talks podcast. And I wish you all the very best for your future endeavors. And please take care of your health. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care. And with that, I leave you with what Terry would say at the end of today's show. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And if you have any questions, you can write to me at deliberatetalks at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow us on the social media channels and the audio platforms. Join in next Monday for a new episode. And until then, please take care of yourself. And don't forget to inspire and be inspired.